yesterday. Uh, my name is Angel, and I'm going to be talking this morning. Uh, we have two actually quite similar uh, presentations. You can see those as just one. And uh, actually, I'm going to be talking a bit about weather types and uh, atmospheric circulation regimes. Well, you know, in a, with a, a bit more detail on the second um, presentation, but this one. Um, I'm going to be talking about these interseasonal impacts of the extra tropics on extreme rainfall events. And this is um, related to some work that we have been doing uh, in uh, southeastern South America and uh, also northeastern US, northeastern uh, North America, and a, a few other places. But I'm going to try to focus on these uh, two places just to illustrate a couple of ideas especially uh, in terms of extreme rainfall events. So um, <clears throat> the plan of this uh, first talk is just to remind you or to discuss a few ideas about these events. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, some of these like typical mechanisms, large scale and regional scale mechanisms that I'm sure that you have discussed last week in uh, far more detail than uh, I'm going to be um, discussing. And then we're going to go to this concrete example for Southeastern South America and for the Northeast US, in particular for the Ohio River Basin, with some work with you know, our team. You're, you're going to see some work that Andy Robertson, who was here last week, um, was uh, doing, I think, a couple of years ago. And then we're going to summarize that. And then we're going to explain you know, how this weather typing thing works and <clears throat> if we could use it or not for this kind of research on uh, tropical, extratropical interactions. So well, I think that you know that extreme events is obviously something, uh, but at least for me, super interesting because it's um, very impactful for society. And uh, we have been having several of these extreme rainfall events, and not only you know temperature extremes, but also rainfall events in uh, um, different places uh, of the Americas. In particular, we had like a couple of really bad events in southeastern South America in Paraguay, and I'm going to visit that one. It's a paper that we're about to submit. But um, something really interesting to me too is that it's extremely difficult to forecast extreme events. So, you know, that's an interesting challenge and it's related to the spatial and temporal characteristics of these uh, events. And in general, there are like different physical mechanisms associated with this um, rainfall <coughs> cases. And you have, of, co of course, the mesoscale convective complexes. And um, since we're trying to focus a bit on the, this extratropical region, you also have these baroclinic fronts and, of course, heat and moisture convection, for example, by the effect of low-level jets. And we have uh, several of those in uh, South America, as you know, but also in uh, uh, North America. And then you have atmospheric rivers. So in order to address all these different um, drivers or physical mechanisms, um, there are different ways, there are different approaches. But what we are trying to do here is trying to see if we can use this idea of synaptic control that probably you already know uh, to try to understand at least or try to unify a few of these different uh, physical mechanisms. And probably you, you know, are aware of these uh, you know, expressions that I'm writing over there. Um, I think that Gorman's team had been like, you know, publishing a, a lot about that. And uh, the general idea, if you are working with extreme rainfall events that are, for example, associated with convective precipitation, you have a few ingredients that you require there. You need some initial lifting force you know, for your parcel. Um, and you need some moisture, for sure. You need some instability. And the idea is um, you may have a few of those or all of them and you might still not have extreme rainfall events. So what we want is to try to find what are those suitable conditions, what are 
uh, those even like at, at synaptic scale, what are those uh, uh, conditions that are conducive to the occurrence of these extreme rainfall events. And we like to use for that approach this uh, uh, weather typing uh, method that we're going to be discussing uh, a bit better <clears throat> later. So I just want to show you um, um, this uh, particular case for Southeast and South America, which is the box that you can see uh, over there. And this is just a particular way to define a, an extreme rainfall index, which is uh, non-local. You are basically considering all the uh, grid boxes uh, for the region of interest. And there are you know, your F, uh, Y, J over there. Um, could be defined in terms of different thresholds, different percentiles. So you can have the 95th, 95th percentile, the 99th, or even like you can use that same definition to address, to analyze uh, dry days. And um, so as I said before, one of the main problems in when you are trying to forecast these extreme events is that um, it's very difficult to do that at a very local level. So what you do, so what you do, you know, you are better at forecasting these events when you are actually considering like a big uh, region. And it will be very nice to have um, kind of a more localized thing, especially, you know, there are, there are a lot of things that we still don't understand that um, most of our seasonal and actually subseasonal um, forecast experiment are addressing these average rainfall events instead of these ones that, again, society considers extremely important. So what you have there uh, in the blue line, which is the same for those three, is the average of uh, rainfall for that box. And in the bars, you actually have, let's say, a, a number, a, a frequency uh, uh, of uh, <clears throat> this extreme event for each one of those thresholds. And what I did at the, the bottom is just to indicate uh, which of those years are um, El Nino years, uh, which is EN, and then you have it strong with an S, moderate or weak, and also I'm indicating which ones are neutral and which ones are, well, not all of them, and which ones are La Nina. So probably you remember that for this particular region, when you have an El Nino, you have more rainfall. And the probability of having extreme rainfall events is higher. <clears throat> and when you have a, a La Nina, it's just the opposite. Um, but then, you know, a simple analysis there will show you that this idea of just using El Nino to forecast, which is a common thing in this region, just using a seasonal driver like El Nino uh, to explain what's going to happen or what's going on in terms of uh, rainfall, average rainfall, and also extreme events is not enough. Uh, you, you can see uh, some cases in which you can actually have, like for example, 2010, you have uh, an El Nino, which is moderate, but you also have a lot of dry days. So you have like this combination of, of stuff, uh, this combination of um, uh, extremes happening at the same time, so you know several dry days, and also uh, a lot of days with a lot of rain. And what we, um, what we are going to say, what we are, have been um, uh, explaining you know, about this kind of event, is like you cannot use only like this uh, uh, typical seasonal driver like El Nino to explain what's, what's happening. And I can talk far more about that. But let me just you know, go back to a few ideas that I'm sure that you discussed last uh, week. And one of these is this uh, uh, typical, you know, concept of marginally propagating Rossby waves. And what I'm showing there is a very simple experiment with a, a shallow water barotropic uh, model. Um, and you can see that um, this, you know, with a small perturbation close to the equator, uh, under certain conditions, you can develop this kind of, uh, I don't know if this has, you can, you can develop this kind of um, wave that we actually, I tried to show you yesterday, at least to some of you, in, uh, in one of the labs. So <clears throat> the idea is, well, as, as you can imagine, that 
there is a connection between obviously the tropics and the exotropics, and in some cases that can actually go back again to the tropics. And uh, what we want to uh, focus on here is that if we uh, analyze changes in the circulation pattern, then we, can, might, we might be able to say something about the occurrence of these extreme uh, rainfall events, as I explained before. Oh, sorry, this is December, January, and February. Yeah, I mentioned to, I, I forgot to mention that. So what we saw here was also December, January, and February, and this is a period that I'm considering 1980 to 2010. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm gonna change that a bit later, but. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna stay over here because um, I need to be closer with the computer. So we have seen this uh, also in, uh, in this workshop. So the idea is like we can also have a link, a connection between the tropics and you know the exotropics, for example, impacting things like the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation. And then this uh, famous paper, Casu already showed that. And it's consistent with this idea of trying to understand what's going on in terms of the spatial and temporal characteristics of the circulation types, of the, of the circulation regimes. And um, uh, as you know, it's, it's there in the literature too, those waves can interact through different uh, mechanisms with other sub-seasonal and seasonal drivers in uh, the region of interest. In particular, we have, and I think that um, Mariano talked about this uh, last Friday, but this is what is called the South Atlantic Convergence Zone, and it's associated with, which is, you know, a subseasonal phenomenon, subseasonal driver, if you want to call it that way, and it's associated with this South American low-level jet, and actually it's not only one South American low-level jet, as we uh, will see, or, you know, probably <clears throat> Mariano already mentioned that too. And the idea is like there are a lot of these different uh, complex interactions at multiple <coughs> spatial and temporal scale um, happening in the region, the same region, but also with this uh, tropical and extratropical um, <clears throat> interference, if you want. So um, this is, um, we, we understand, you know, so it's already in the literature, this is also associated uh, with this, with other phenomena like the low-level jets, as I was um, discussing <clears throat> before. Um, so I'm coming to this point, the idea of synaptic control, the idea of if I pay attention, if I try to really characterize and understand what's going on in terms of, of the atmospheric circulation on, and how th those uh, circulation patterns change in terms of location or frequency of occurrence or persistence, intensity, et cetera, we can uh, try to understand better um, what's going to happen or what, what's happening uh, <clears throat> with the extreme rainfall events. So something that you can do, and it's not important right now how we define this, is to uh, take a look at those uh, typical uh, or recurrent circulation types, circulation regimes. And you will be able to identify there a few of these uh, barclay propagation <clears throat> uh, systems and also um, waves, you know, these other uh, marginally propagating Rossby waves that uh, could start like, you know, close to the tropic and then they interact with the jet stream. And, and this is like obviously a hemispheric view, but once you go to the region, you can recognize things that the forecasters at weather time scales <clears throat> see, let's say, every day. And the way you define these ones, these uh, circulation types, like you can only have one of those per day. There are different ways to do that. But in this particular case, that's how I'm, I'm defining those. Um, and you can see, um, in some cases, you can see directly like um, the low level jet, the South American low level jet. But as you probably know, there are uh, different flavors of that one, the CHAC one, the not CHAC event. And um, you can, uh, relate those, you know, the, the beauty of the, of the approach, I think, is that you can explain what is the physical outcome, in this case, the rainfall extreme events, or a sunny day, or, you know, snowy day, in terms of, uh, well, not for December, January, and February, but in general, um, in terms of 
links to the climate drivers like ENSO, but also SACS, let's say, uh, different time scales, different temporal scales, but also coming from the tropics or, or the exotropics. And um, the actual mechanism, like for example, baroclinic fronts that may be impacting um, the region, that may be producing this, um, this event. And what you do, well, if you want to characterize, as I just said, like the relationship between the circulation patterns and the occurrence of, of another of extreme events, you can, you can do a few things. Like the first one is just a composite analysis for each one of those regimes, which are built on a daily basis. You say, well, what is the typical rainfall pattern? Or what is the typical rainfall anomaly? Why composite of rainfall anomalies associated with each one of those Each one of those. Let me try again. Yeah, you fixed it before, but hello. Okay. Hey. Okay, so um, what I was saying is just like there are different ways to do this, and this is just a composite analysis. And by the way, all these things that you are seeing here, we can reproduce, and we are actually going to be uh, reproducing a few of those in the labs. So if you think that this approach uh, makes sense for your projects, just let us know because we can tailor this you know, this afternoon for your for your project. Especially, I'm going to be showing um, in the next presentation uh, the things that I have planned uh, for this afternoon. Okay, so um, well, you can see that if you're interested in extreme events, and again, this is this is just the composite, this is the average. But if you are interested in, in rainfall, in a lot of rainfall or above normal rainfall, you should be paying attention to whether to the um, uh, circulation regimes that we're calling here D, E, and F. Okay, we'll go to the weather typing thing later. And something else that you can do is just to do, um, you know, you can use physics and also a statistical analysis, like in this case, and try to see which particular circulation regimes are associated with the occurrence of this extreme for each one of those thresholds that I mentioned before. And you can see that um, there is, uh, for the regime number four and number six, maybe I needed to do, to have the, the computer. Um, so for these two, this one, you know, and you can see the low level jet over there. And for this other one, you can see that those are statistically significant, at, you know, 95% per um, the P, sorry, P.05. Um, these two are statistically significant associated with the occurrence of those extreme events. But even when the five is not really statistically significant because of the transitions that occur between the different uh, patterns, circulation patterns, number five is actually also, from a physical point of view, also associated with extreme rainfall events. And for the dry events, actually, one, two, and three are, are you know, most, more commonly associated with those dry events that I uh, mentioned before. So. I don't know if you are aware, this microphone is confusing me a bit, but I don't know if you are aware of this um, particular event that happened between December and February 2015-2016. It was reported as you know, one of the worst uh, things that occurred in the uh, actually lower Paraguay River Basin in the last 18 years, and uh, something like 130,000 people um, you know, were displaced and it was a, a really bad thing over there, and they weren't expecting that. The interesting thing is that the seasonal forecast actually uh, suggested that something like that might happen. Obviously, it was a seasonal forecast, so it was like three months or something like that. And then we could actually have forecast that using the S2S database. 
But the important thing is, if we want to understand what happened, we can also use like this synaptic control approach, this weather typing approach, to identify what were the drivers. And once you do that, actually the answer is kind of, you know, uh, trivial, something that we already know, at least in the, in the academic literature. But anyway, so what you can see on the lower panel there is the typical behavior for uh, psi for the stream function. Um, and then on the bottom panel, what you have is a, a series of this um, uh, rainfall anomalies for each one of those months. And in brief, what you can do there um, is just to, to analyze what the, the question that we are trying to answer in this um, paper is to see if that was really an extreme event or it was you know, a common extreme event. It was something that we could have uh, forecasted well, but also it was like a traditional mechanism, and actually it was. And as you um, will see in a bit, it's just a no chaco uh, um, low-level jet event. Um, and we can get to that conclusion, you know, using a traditional, if you want, a EOF analysis, but also this kind of uh, weather regime approach uh, for different variables in this particular case for the circulation, for the, um, the stream function. And you will be able to, you know, you, you can identify, and which is, that's the kind of stuff that we want to do in the labs too, which are the uh, regimes associated with that particular um, occurrence of events. And in brief, I, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but in brief, there was a, a constructive interference between El Nino for that year, which, as you might remember, was one of the strongest on record, and then an initially high occurrence um, and persistence, let's call it like that, of the phase four of MJO that, as you might um, have seen, we were playing with this yesterday in the lab, and I think last week again with Andy, um, it, uh, when you analyze the composite, when you do a composite analysis for the MJO phase four for that region, you can see that it has um, typical behavior of uh, above normal, a lot of rainfall in the south of Paraguay, northern uh, Uruguay, and southern uh, Brazil. And that's basically what you observed uh, for that particular event. So this combination, this tropical extratropical interaction, this combination, if you want cross time scale interference, um, uh, provided suitable conditions for the alternation of two of those uh, weather regimes that I mentioned before. And maybe the most important, not maybe, for sure the most important was like this uh, low level uh, jet, which is characterized or is, is called a non Chaco one. The Chaco one will produce a lot of rainfall um, in this region in northern Argentina, but the non Chaco one actually tends to bring a lot of rainfall in that direction. And we know that there is a relation every time there is El Nino, there are enhanced uh, probabilities of uh, more advection of uh, moisture from the Amazon. Um, and that we also know that with MJO, this kind of behavior tends to happen. So it was, we, you know, we could have said uh, uh, something, we could have forecast that event actually well in advance, at least two weeks and probably a month in advance with the different tool we had and, we, and, and with the understanding of the physical mechanisms and we could have like saved uh, so many lives actually. The same idea could be applied now to, you know, different but kind of similar uh, region in, in the sense that is um, the exotropics too. And now what we're gonna do is just to take a look using the same uh, kind of approach to the northeast of uh, the US. And all pre previous studies like Nakamura et al. Um, analyzed what were the condition, the, the atmospheric circulation patterns associated with the occurrence of that um, kind of events. And this is, the typical, this is the typical behavior, or this is the typical circulation uh, pattern that you uh, find associated with extreme rainfall on the Ohio River Basin. And it's associated, as you can see, with basically uh, advection of heat and moisture from um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico towards the region of interest. And, um, you know, has been like that in this particular analysis, you know, 
more than 100 years um, was um, analyzed and it's basically the same pattern. It hasn't changed uh, a lot. So if we see, if we can forecast in advance um, this circulation type, we might be able again to um, take advantage of the situation. And as you might know, for dynamical model is far easier to forecast winds and advection and this kind of circulation types than to actually forecast rainfall. So, or I knew an extreme uh, rainfall events, as I mentioned before, that's uh, you know kind of complicated. So the idea is try to is try to take advantage of that uh, situation. So um, this particular analysis that Andy uh, performed was published in 2015. They uh, extensively analyzed what are the conditions associated with this particular uh, circulation type, which is the one that Nakamura et al. reported before too and that actually um, we later analyze in, in other terms. But you can do the same kind of approach that I mentioned before, which is now that I have, now that I know which are the um, circulation regimes associated for that particular season, and by the way, in this case is MAM, um, you can again use physics or, you know, help yourself with a bit of statistics to identify which ones are the weather regimes associated with extreme rainfall events, and those are the ones that Andy and uh, his team uh, reported for that particular case, so number two and number four, and you can see the number four is uh, particularly uh, important for extreme rainfall event, and is the one that has been reported before. The other one um, is uh, similar, but more of a coastal, um, associated with coastal extreme rainfall events, or even coastal uh, rainfall events. And something else that we uh, have been doing is trying to analyze how well that is represented by different models and by different configurations in those models. Again, trying to, uh, trying to understand uh, those tropical, extratropical interaction and those cross time scale interference that I mentioned before. And it actually, for that particular regime, models tend to be very good, you know, tends to be um, at least decent enough to, in terms of the representation of those uh, events. That, couldn't, that cannot be said for you know, all the other um, cases, all the other regimes, but this is like good news if we are talking about extreme rainfall events for the Northeast. In particular, you can see in this case is again like the composites for, the, um, um, for uh, rainfall for that particular pattern, atmospheric circulation pattern, and the different uh, experiments run in particular with these GFDL models at different uh, spatial resolutions uh, provide um, a good representation of uh, at least the spatial pattern of rainfall, not necessarily the um, spatial characteristics of the of, of rainfall. Um, but you know, it's like it's good enough. So. Um, just to summarize these ideas for the first part of the talk, I just wanted to say that, of course, there are different mechanisms, and some of those might be related, and you can say that there is some interaction between them, but, but that might not be the case. And the idea is, can we have um, an approach based on synoptic or larger scale or regional scale atmospheric circulation patterns uh, that can provide a good understanding of what's going on or what might happen, and also that can help us identify what are the climate drivers associated with, the, with the, that kind of events, like in this case, extreme rainfall events in the exotropics, and uh, can talk a bit, that can uh, say something about those interactions between the tropics and the exotropics, between the different time scales, between the different spatial scales, um, and we think that Indeed, that's possible, for example, if we use the uh, weather typing approach that several, of, uh, peop no, several people here in this room have been using and um, you know, have far more experience that, um, than me. But let me just go to the other presentation. Because something that we're gonna be doing in the labs is I'm gonna provide these codes and we're gonna be able to reproduce those figures and more. So those are tools that if you consider are useful for your uh, experiments, you can basically assimilate right now. 
And um, actually, in, I'm going to be showing a particular example here for uh, what we just did was MAM in the northeast of US. And just, you know, uh, we're going to uh, choose basically the same region, but now a different season just to illustrate that uh, the approach tends to be, you know, it doesn't work always, but in this case, it's, um, it's robust enough as to work in this case for December, January, and February. And what we're going to be able to do is to build, we can call it that love triangle between the synoptic or the circulation, uh, the first circulation pattern, the climate driver, and the actual impact event that we are interested in analyzing, like the uh, extreme rainfall event in this case. Or, you know, might be, we don't need that to be an extreme rainfall one. And uh, something else that I'm going to be uh, doing here is um, trying to explore the question of if we can uh, take advantage of those top tropical, extratropical interactions to have uh, enhanced, improved skill, um, not only for seasonal scale, but also uh, interseasonal scale. And this has to do with a few, I'm going to be like going back to a couple of uh, papers that we have published on, on that topic. And I don't know how familiar you are with this idea, but you can, you know, you can try to always go to um, um, better resolution, higher resolution in your um, dynamical models, or to have better statistical models, or to have like better, better combination of those uh, models, let's call them hybrid models. But you can also try to uh, use something that in the literature sometimes is often called a coarse grain approach. Let's say that, in, that we want to understand what are the physical um, available states of the system. So, um, you know, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot expect to see a circulation regime with a happy face in the atmosphere. You know, there are obviously physical laws that are telling me these are the different states that the system can um, use. And if I can characterize um, those states and I can say, well, the probability of the transition of my system from this particular state to this other one is, I don't know, this number. And I know that this particular transition is associated with extreme rainfall events or sunny days or not. I might have an additional tool. I might have like additional information to say something about what might happen or not um, for those events that are of interest to, to me. So um, as you can imagine, that is often called a nonlinear dynamical perspective. Uh, for uh, to analyze this kind of problem, and a lot of people, you know, have been working on that. David, um, and a lot of people have been working on that. In, in this particular case, I'm just like I like this uh, figure. I like to use this figure if you are not too um, um, used to the idea of this available set of the system. And what uh, Tim Palmer is uh, basically telling us there is that. Um, do you have in those cups are, let's say, like your, your two options for your uh, system. Let's say one is it rains and the other one is it doesn't rain. And we might not have enough information as to say exactly how the system is choosing between those two and how that is reacting to the uh, effect of an external forcing. But we might be able to use th that nonlinear dynamical perspective or approach to try to provide additional information on what are the chances that it's going to rain or it's not going to rain. So that's at least you know, one way to uh, understand uh, <clears throat> that uh, approach. You can imagine that you have, for a particular season or for a particular decade, you have, let's say, three available states, A, B, and C. And if you uh, think in terms of that approach, you might say whatever happens might be understood as a um, combination as a sequence of those different available states. So, for example, a sunny day might be just A, 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 A. Or maybe an extreme rainfall event, like the ones that I just showed in the previous presentation, might be something like A, B, C, or A, B, B, A. So, if you identify, you can, there are some, you know, similarities here between um, the circulation regimes and circulation types and an alphabet. So you might be able to identify what are the words associated with you know, the different available states, 
but also um, what are the letters, sorry, but also what are the words that are associated with your particular event of interest. And you will be able to write that down. Like, you know, every time I see um, um, cold front happening over this region, that tends to be associated with something like BBA or BBC, for example. So in this coarse um, grain approach, um, you might be able to use these circulation times and the, and the sequences of circulation type, uh, types to say something about the system. And this brings us to the idea of how to define those states, available states. And that is not a trivial problem. That's a, actually a very uh, complex one. Um, one way to approach, one, a proxy for those available states uh, might be to use uh, cluster analysis. And there are different ways to do that. But in particular, we can use, and this is what I have prepared for the labs in this uh, afternoon. You can, use a, you can use a K means approach. And basically, what you are doing is, let's say that you have, I don't know, for uh, a typical three month season, like 90 days, and you have 30 years or so, you have almost 3,000 days. And what you want to do is to classify those 3,000 days in a certain number of clusters. And what you do is at the end, you get, um, you can. Uh, use some statistics to get some help in terms of, you know, what is the adequate number, what is a nice number of clusters to use. But I think that the best is to use uh, physics and actually to understand what are the physical mechanisms and see if those clusters that you are obtaining using your, um, let's call it, a blind method are um, something that you can recognize in terms of the physical processes for that region. So let's say in this particular case, there are seven clusters. So these are similar days, and these are like the different circulation patterns that I have been uh, talking about. And again, there are different ways to define this. And actually, for each method, there are uh, subtleties. There are different ways to, um, you know, there are different approaches. But basically, what do you want in this k-means approach is to minimize the, um, um, those uh, distances that are typically associated or are typically chosen as the Euclidean metric. But you can use something else like a Mahalanobis, Mahalanobis um, metric, too. And then there are different, again, uh, ways to um, know, to assess uh, how well that classification method has worked for me. And a typical classificability index use is that of uh, Michelangeli et al. from 1995. Uh, but again, I think that to be able to recognize, uh, to, to be able to see if those particular clusters, those uh, weather types, make sense or not from a physical point of view. And if I can, for example, since um, those weather types are actually associated, I can compute, as I said before, the, the, the probability of having a transition from weather type number one to weather type number three. If I can see in some of those cases even like uh, some uh, uh, waves propagating, or if I can actually uh, see that it makes sense, um, the physical mechanism that, that the, those sequences are um, explaining, so then you know, there is a physical background. There, is a, there are physical reasons to decide what, how to approach that problem. And then in this kind of approach, we want to pay special attention to those daily transitions, as I just mentioned, the duration, the persistence or not of those weather regimes, um, and then the frequency characteristics at different time scales from subseasonal to decadal, even if you want to climate change. Those statistics provide um, a nice tool to understand what's going on, not only in terms of those extreme events, uh, we also pay attention to the spatial patterns, and we can use this method, as I said before, to identify uh, candidate predictors for a, a model or how well. We can even use this to diagnose how well my dynamical models are working uh, for that particular region and season. So, um, so there are several advantages of this uh, um, approach. So I'm going to show you what you're going to be running as a first experiment in uh, your lab this afternoon, and again, this is going to be for the north, for this region that I mentioned before, in uh, North America, the northeast North America, a bit of Canada, and and you know the U.S. And this, in this particular case, is going to be December, January, and February. And what we are going to be, um, what I'm going to be showing here is the different 
products or the different um, plots or the different yeah, tools that you can use that you might be able to use or not for your project of interest. Originally, you know, when we were discussing this with uh, Fred and David and other people, uh, we just thought that we will um, have some exercises so people can work on different regions of the world with the same approach. So, for example, Southeast and South America, like the weather types that I showed before, those typical six that have been reported in the literature by several authors. Then, like the, you know, typical four for the uh, North Atlantic European uh, region, and then something else for Africa and, uh, and for Asia. Um, but this morning I was just discussing with Fred the possibility that we might just like focus on the actual projects that you have developed so we don't um, you know, deviate attention from, from those. So it's up to you, we'll discuss that later. So what we're gonna be able to do is to, you're gonna have a MATLAB code. We have this in you know, different languages but we decided to use MATLAB for this lab, and you're gonna be running that, and you're gonna be able to get those um, five clusters, five circulation types, again, this is December, January, and February, and in, on the top panel, you are seeing the entire hemisphere, but you, if you want, you can change the region that you are using to define the um, uh, weather regimes. Um, and then, obviously, one thing is that region that you use for your cluster analysis, another, Different one is like the one that you used to visualize. But in this particular case, we got this um, five. Usually for December, January, and February, uh, we tend to use four or five of these uh, solutions. We can talk more about that later. And you will be able to have, you know, for your experiment, the um, hemispheric um, view of those weather types. And some of those you can even like uh, recognize a few of those baroclinic, like wave propagating, like wave trains that we have also mentioned before. And then you will be able to do a zoom in that you can tailor, that you can customize if you want. And um, in this particular case, we're using geopotential height of 500 millibars, but you can also use uh, different variables. That's what you want, like what we did with this recent paper for uh, the Paraguay River Basin that we were just using uh, a stream function. So we'll be able to help you with that if you want. So let's say that we will pay attention to what are the spatial characteristics of those circulation patterns and um, those winds, and, you know, those vectors might just mean winds, but um, something that uh, could be nice to do is just the integral of the, um, let's say the moisture transport along the, the column, along the, the atmospheric column to see, you know, like this, in this case, if, if uh, I can have uh, rainfall, uh, extreme rainfall events associated with the weather type number three, which is similar to what I showed before in the uh, MAM in March, April, May. And um, also, it will provide you uh, this composite for um, average rainfall. You can modify that if you want to take a look at, at the extremes. And also those um, other figures that I showed before when you are um, analyzing which of those weather types is associated with that extreme events, and you can define that threshold or whatever you call um, extreme. So something else that I mentioned is that we also want to pay attention to the um, uh, temporal characteristics, for example, the daily transition. So I know that this plot looks like noise or even like art, and actually, you know, um, it looks like, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, uh, clay, uh, the clay work. So actually we're calling those things in 2015 clay diagrams. And what you are seeing there is for, uh, remember the, in this case we have December, January, and February. Um, and so you have a um, certain number of years, 1981 to 2010. So for each one of these columns you have um, let's say it's not a year, it's basically a season, December, January, and February. So your first uh, tile over here is December 1st, and your last one is the last day of your season, which is in this case the last day of February. And you have, what you are seeing here is the daily evolution of those weather types. So I don't know if this is really um, the clay diagram by itself is useful, but you can use it to build a few useful things in terms of characterizing or analyzing the uh, temporal evolution of these 
patterns. For example, you can, from that matrix, from, from that clay diagram, you can build a transition matrix, and then you can have an idea of typically, you know, for when you consider all those years, or you can just have that for a, a subset, for a smaller sample, not too small. You can say, well, if uh, I am um, today and uh, weather type number one, what are the prob what's the probability that it persists? And you can see that it's fairly high, or that it actually uh, goes to a different uh, weather type, it, it um, transition to a different weather type. So this means that you can actually build some kind of a Markovian model, or formally a Markovian model, with this kind of information that you are observing. And you know, you can also, if you want to diagnose how well your dynamical models are um, reproducing these characteristics, the temporal characteristics of your uh, circulation regimes, you can use also the transition ma matrix uh, to diagnose, to evaluate, to assess um, your model if that's something that you're interested in. Of course, then you can go to different time scales and you can um, just do some uh, filtering that is suitable for the intraseasonal time scale, and you can see how, for your particular season, December, January, and February, how um, how is the subseasonal evolution, or you know, some people are calling this the subseasonality um, associated with each one. What is the subseasonal evolution of each one of those weather types? Maybe some of them are going to be appearing more often at the beginning of the season or at the end. And, you know, there's um, some useful information that you can um, obtain. Like, this particular weather type tends to appear more often at the very beginning of the season, and it's associated with beautiful sunny days. But these other two are associated with rainfall or, you know, are just like the precursors for a transition to a um, rainy season that is going to come um, after this one. And I can see them happening a lot at the end. Anyway, so all these um, plots are going to be available, um, you know, for you in that code if you want to play a bit with that for your project. And of course, you can go to the next and the next and the next um, time scale. So in this kind of plot, you're going to be able to see the interannual evolution of uh, the frequencies of occurrence of your weather types. And of course, we only have 30 years in this case, so we are not going to be able to say a lot about decadal and definitely nothing about uh, climate change. But uh, you, if you have enough years, you might be able to use the same approach to go to um, those other time scales. So this is what I think is interesting, and this is what we did uh, for those uh, papers, for those for that work that I started to discuss in the previous presentation. But I didn't want to include this um, there. Just you know that discussion about the importance of using circulation regimes or, or atmospheric circulation patterns. But this is one of the nice things about the method because then you can remember that. Um, you know, link that triangle that I mentioned before between once I have identified what are those proxies of the available state of the system, I can try to identify what are uh, suitable candidate predictors or climate drivers associated with them. So, you know, there are different ways to do this, but you can say, well, what are the typical SST patterns associated with each one of those weather types? Or if I have a really high frequency of occurrence of this particular weather type, what's the typical SST pattern associated with that, for example, 80th percentile of occurrence, you know, the frequency of that weather type. So you can see, well, uh, it's associated with an El Nino uh, SST pattern or something that is of interest in the Atlantic or, sorry, or in the Indian Ocean. So you can start playing with that. And this is a particular example for SST, but but of course, you can do that with different fields. And you can do a, you know, the traditional approach, trying to compute correlation. Again, that's not you know, associated with cause and effect. But you can try to find some um, statistical correlations between the frequency of occurrence of your weather types you know, at different time scales. In this case, it's seasonal. And for example, things like El Nino, as I just mentioned, but also PNA or NAO. And you know, depending on your region, you might have like more or less um, of these uh, climate drivers. So you might be able to say, well, you know, I need to take a look at the physics. But from a statistical point of view, every time I have um, 
in this case is an El Nino, but if this is like statistically significant over here, will be like a La Nina every time I have a La Nina, uh, I might have like some um, um, inhibition of this particular mechanism that is going to make you know, that I have like a lot of more uh, dry days in my season for this particular region. Or since I have a more El Nino, so then uh, probably I'm gonna have more um, meridionally propagating Rosby waves coming in my direction, and those are gonna be affecting uh, the circulation patterns that are gonna be able to produce or not these extreme rainfall events in my region, and also it's gonna impact uh, the NAO Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you're going to be able to produce all these plots this afternoon, and then those, you know, that is uh, kind of, you know, some examples for the seasonal scale. But then you can do something similar too for the um, subseasonal one, and this is something like what Kasu uh, um, shows in that uh, 2008 paper. So what you are seeing there in those colors is actually the uh, anomalous percentage of occurrence, so it's like a measure of frequency, and you can imagine that that is a um, percentage. Um, percentage. And, and what you have is, in this case, uh, those five weather types that we have been using in this particular example, and you can say uh, what you have on the vertical axis is, is the lag, so you can say something about when the MJO is in this particular phase, let's say phase number six, um, from 14 days to 10 days in advance, I know that um, <clears throat> there are higher chances that I have this particular weather type happening you know, after those 14 or 10 days. So you can link the same thing that we did before with the seasonal um, uh, drivers. You can just identify, in this case I'm just showing MJO, but something that we did for Southeast and South America was to um, consider three different subseasonal drivers, MJO, SACS, and then um, some uh, South American monsoon index, which uh, has like a strong uh, peak at uh, subseasonal scale. And you can identify, you can try to use these kind of tools to identify which are candidate predictors and how they might or they might not interact at different time scales and if they are associated with tropical or subtropical um, sources of predictability. So, um, I don't know if uh, um, you know. You want me to talk more about uh, this? Basically, blue means that um, the frequency of occurrence is, uh, you know, let's say that blue means less frequent and red means more uh, frequent occurrence of the uh, particular weather type associated with each one of the MJO phases. And what you have here is just, as I said before, the lag, the lead time. Um, that you are observing. And again, you can use this kind of plots to, to diagnose uh, if those uh, links, if those uh, mechanisms ap appear uh, are well represented or not in your model. So I just want to um, um, use the rest of my time just to talk a bit about uh, this idea of, of trying to take advantage of the uh, tropical, extratropical interactions that we are discussing in this uh, advanced school um, in terms of, uh, of predictability and how that actually relates to uh, this weather typing method that um, we have been discussing here. And I think that probably you know that uh, figure is just a summary of, you know, in a qualitative way, uh, what is the forecast skill associated with the weather forecast, the seasonal forecast, and the subseasonal forecast. And as we know, I think that we know pretty well, this is a school focused on the interseasonal scale. Um, <clears throat> so the interseasonal scale, our models for the interseasonal inter scale are not that good yet. It depends on when, it depends on, you know, if you're considered week three, week four, um, it depends on where. But what if, using these tropical, extratropical inter interactions that we're discussing in the school, you can actually pump predictability from different time scales so you can have higher uh, predictive scale for the subseasonal, um, um, you know, for week two or week three or both together. And this has been um, discussed uh, by several authors. And, um, you know, this is just a pictorial representation of that idea. So. You know, they, they talk about the um, uh, interactions between ENSO and the MBGO and if they are in a constructive phase, so they can like, reinforce and you 
uh, might have, which is actually the answer for that uh, uh, plot that I mentioned uh, before with extreme events. And we said, well, ENSO is not the only driver explaining what's happening here, because if it's only for uh, El Nino, I should have like a lot of rainfall extreme events for uh, Southeast and South America, but I am also having a lot of dry events. So those interactions between the tropics and the extra the tropical and the extratropical climate drivers, um, or, or, or only you know extratropical ones, or you know different time scale or, or the same one, are important to understand what's going on in terms of impacts for uh, society, and also in terms of um, you know maybe more academic uh, questions. And I don't think I need to show this one, but you know we, we can take a look at what is the um, representation, what is the translation of all that in terms of the space phase. But, um, you know, putting all the pieces together, what we want is to be able to consider our dynamical models should be able to consider those interactions um, straightforward, but that is not um, always happening. And for a particular region, I might be able to use this approach that I just showed to you to identify the different candidate predictors, try to understand better what's going on uh, in terms of the um, different spatial and temporal characteristics and how they are impacting the occurrence or not of you know rainfall or or heat waves in my in my region, and I might be able to identify a lot of those uh, climate drivers. This is just a subset, just an example, but a different approach is just to try to identify what are those available or proxies for the available states of the system, and then use them to try to understand both the physical mechanisms and the links to those climate drivers. And if, I, if, if I'm successful at that approach, I might be able to build statistical models in terms of the uh, characteristics, the temporal characteristics, for example, of those uh, weather regimes, or I can even like, use those regimes to bias correct the dynamical um, output of the model. And, um, you know, we have been doing a bit of that with the dynamical models, doing like some rectification, weather type uh, rectification, and, and that has um, proven to be um, actually uh, very useful in terms of, uh, you know, um, providing better products for society at different time scales. But the overall idea is that um, since we have a lot of these interactions that we have been discussing. Um, it seems more than adequate to uh, pay attention to those possible uh, phase locking between uh, climate drivers acting at different time scales and try to take advantage of that in order to have uh, skill enhan enhancement to have improvement of, of our skill. And we have proven that, for example, for Southeast and South America, the use of that approach, like considering in our models, uh, models that consider those interactions provide a better skill for extreme uh, rainfall event. And as you can see, this is, this is uh, following more of a local approach for the forecast of extreme rainfall events, which, as I said before, is extremely difficult. And this approach is actually, it looks promising. But also, it might be useful for uh, providing additional information um, for, uh, Subseasonal time scales, and just you know, just to finish my my talk here, um, I just want to um, describe this approach that we uh, have been using in different places of the world, um, and that is based on these uh, circulation regimes. And again, it's um, you can consider it uh, a way to build subseasonal scenarios. And this is not the first time we're not the first people talking about this kind of a scenario. These are not climate change scenarios; they're just like subseasonal to seasonal. Um, Moron et al. have been also working with this approach in other places um, of the world um, using sl a slightly different approach. So in our case, he has been using, he has, let's say that he has built building those scenarios using a cluster of the different rainfall regimes that you may have in that particular region. But since uh, models are better are forecasting or you know describing uh, circulation regimes, our method is based on those uh, circulation regimes. So we start again with, those, with that 
kind of clay diagram. And this is the one associated with December, January, and February with the austral summer for uh, this particular region, as you um, saw before in a few of my slides. And what we are doing here is trying to, obviously there is, you know, we are like simplifying the system. We're um, trying to, you know, construct a um, simplified approach, but you can actually um, try to create clusters with this 90 day sequences of your clay diagram. We are not expecting that to be uh, perfect. We are not expecting to be able to say what's going to happen in this particular day within the season. What we want to see if, is if we can actually build, if we can classify, we can do some kind of um, analog and say, well, typically we have these kind of years or that other kind of years and um, try to take advantage of that information that we have from the observations and depend on how well the model reproduces that, and then you know if that's good enough, we can take advantage of that to say, well, this year when we have this particular uh, phase of ENSO, and we have um, um, these phases of MGO at the very beginning of the of the season, what we might expect is this kind of um, um, behavior, like more rainfall at the beginning of the year or at the end, and that has actually proven to be. Um, um, skillful enough, um, I, I have doubts about using the word skillful because this is not formally a forecast model, but um, that has been able to provide uh, useful information um, that, that potentially could be used for decision makers to uh, characterize what might happen in, in, in the next season at, at a subseasonal time scale. And well, there are different ways to do this, and I, I don't know if I have time to uh, describe in detail the approach, but it's, it's already published out there. And the main message, I don't know if actually, in terms of time, I'm, I don't know if I'm early or late. <laughs> okay, so um, the main message here is, um, let's say that you just woke up. So the, the main message here is, we might be able, not tool is perfect, but we might be able to use uh, weather types, a circulation, a synoptic scale, a circulation pattern approach to understand uh, what are the physical mechanisms behind things like extreme rainfall events, but not necessarily extreme rainfall events because the whole idea is that we are using uh, those states to um, explain the particular event that is of interest to me, even if that is like sunny days. And we cannot only try to understand better what are the physical mechanisms, but we can also try to identify what are the climate drivers, the candidate predictors behind those uh, physical mechanisms and let's say uh, impactful events and have, you know, like not a perfect, but at least a um, useful approach to try to understand better the forecasts that are being provided by uh, dynamical models and that could provide information not only at a you know, more traditional seasonal scale, but also uh, uh, provide additional information at something like the interseasonal evolution or the interseasonal characteristics of that season of interest to me. And well, you know, we can talk far more about that, but, but that's the idea. So in, in practical terms, this translates to uh, more work in the labs so I'm going to be able to provide this code in MATLAB. It has almost, you know, it's a short, simplified version. Maybe it's not the most elegant one, but you will you will have there about 2,000 lines of code, of code that you can you know modify and play with. And all the figures that have been shown, in particular in this presentation, are going to be um, you know available for you if you think that that is useful for your project or just to have fun. Uh, and you can modify and tailor that to different regions of the world and for different seasons, um, you know, even different length of the season, and you will be able to build, if you consider these weather types as building blocks, because they are a daily, daily scale, you can, um, you know, try to use that to understand different time scales and those tropical, extratropical interactions that we have been discussing in this school. So that's it. <clears throat>